Well, thank you. Thank you, Rick and David. Actually, um, you teed up my talk actually perfectly, and I really appreciate that. So I'm an infrastructure person. If you look at my grant portfolio, I have a training grant, I have a P30 core center, I have a here center, um, I'm a big part of the CTSA. So most of what I do is infrastructure, and this talk is really about research infrastructure. And I'm going to talk about more than why we need an exposome map and what it would consist of. So on the need for an exposome atlas and or map. So atlases are books that contain multiple maps. So you can also think of this as an atlas. So what are the challenges? What are the barriers? What are the opportunities in, in building such a map? Uh, how do we leverage what we already know? Advances in assays, data mining, mapping itself. Uh, biology, artificial intelligence, and imputation and modeling. Uh, I'm going to take a step back and talk about the HapMap project uh, and why it was created and what it's used for. And I'm going to propose that we, if we were to build an exposome map, we could actually create something that I'm going to call exposomic tag markers. And I'll define that a little bit later in the talk. And I'm also going to talk about community engagement, who participates in an exposome map, who benefits, and who does not. So this is a slide uh, that Dr. Wojciech actually slow, showed earlier. It talks about all the different types of data that get involved in uh, the measurement of the exposome. These are questionnaires, they are GIS maps, they could be pictures, they might be biomarkers, they might be mobile wearable devices, and they all get integrated in. And I'm going to talk about another layer that I think this uh, figure actually left out. Uh, the data are highly complex, structured and unstructured. But there's also aging and period effects. So your exposome changes if you're two years old versus six years old versus 15 versus 30 versus 70 versus 80. It's constantly changing by life stage. And it changes in predictable ways. That's not random change. There's also period effects. The exposome in the United States is different today than it was in 1990. It's different in 1990 than it was in 1970. So there are effects that are changing over time just in our general environment because of our culture and society and different advances. And these all have to be incorporated. And in fact, the way this slide is structured, it makes it look like all these data are actually separate and can be integrated. They should be integrated. I think the way to integrate them actually is primarily through geography, factoring all of these things in. So what are the barriers to creating an exposome map? Well, we have to objectively measure the past. So if we do an untargeted assay in blood or urine today, that tells us what your, what your environment is today, but your health is a greater predictor of what your environment was in the past, or the environment of your past predicts your health far better. So these cross-sectional analyses are not as helpful as if we can go backwards in time. So we really want to get to the past. So we can get there, and there are ways to get there. And that's the argument I'm going to make, that a map will actually help us. Uh, there's a lack of data on the health impact of the majority of the exposures in our environment. So there's uncertainty or even subjectivity about which environmental exposures are important. And we simply need more data. We need more data on people. We need more people that we measure it on. We need more exposures that we measure. And we need it both today and we need it from the past. And we need time series data. There's already some big data sets out there, like NHANES. We need longitudinal exposure data across all life stages, ECHO, all of us, and uh, the other types of consortium that Dr. Wojciech talked about can all provide some of that data. And we need data that reflect the geospatial variability of the exposome, even biomarkers. I think every time we measure a biomarker, we should attach a geospatial coordinate to it, because that's information that can be very, very useful. And obviously, because these data are so disparate, structured and unstructured, we're going to need ways to bring them together in harmonization. So, and then there's biology. So many of us have, are familiar with the concept of the developmental origins of health and disease. Uh, exposomics is a big part of this. So the clinical research situation, however, that, we, that exists is, let's say, we want to study heart attacks in people who are alive today who've had heart attacks. And we think the origin of their heart attack may have been their mother's diet when, they were, when she was pregnant with them. We may be going back to the 1940s and 1950s. So that's very, very difficult to do. 
But the situation that we have is illness is happening now, and in the environment or the exposome that we want to measure happened in the past. So how do we do that? So DOHAD posits that the illness has its origins in the distant past. Well, maybe we don't have to measure it, which would obviously be very, very difficult. Maybe we could model it. Maybe we could actually gather data and understand the covariance structure of the exposome. Something I think sometimes forgets forgotten is that even an environmental exposure, which may not be causative of a health outcome, might be a correlate of something that is. And as we build these maps of the exposome, we may be able to leverage that information to better understand the role of environment. So, and then there's another concept of biology, which is critical windows. So exposomics really is, I would argue, the key to understanding gene environment interactions. I think the vast majority of the missing heritability are unmeasured gene environment interactions. And they involve critical windows of exposure. And I would argue that most or many gene environment interactions are actually the intersection of biological development and an environmental exposure. So this is a slide that shows expression of hemoglobin molecules. So hemoglobin is a tetramer. There's an alpha molecule, because it's alpha 2, beta 2 in every, pretty much everybody in this room. But when you're a fetus, there's, uh, it's alpha 2, uh, gamma 2. Gamma is fetal hemoglobin. So if you're doing a gene environment interaction study, and you're looking at a prenatal exposure, and you hypothesize, oops, you hypothesize that there's a genetic variant that interacts with the beta hemoglobin molecule. If you measure an exposure during pregnancy, you would see no effect. But you might see a strong effect if you measure that exposure two years later. So gene environment interactions are actually dependent on timing of the exposure. And a chemical that bound to beta hemoglobin uh, but not gamma hemoglobin, which is fetal hemoglobin, would have the opposite impact. So as I said, critical windows are really just the intersection of gene expression and environmental exposures and variant, genetic variants, such as SNPs, may be on top of that. Both of them are time varied. Oops. So going back to the HAP map. So why did genomics need a haplotype map? Well, the HAP map enabled geneticists to take advantage of how SNPs and other genetic variants are organized spatially. Variants that are near each other tend to be inherited together. And these regions of linked variants are known as haplotypes. The exposome is also not random. There are exposures that tend to occur together. We know this for a fact. In fact, uh, I probably worded this incorrectly. I wrote it as a question. It's probably better to say there are exposures that represent high probability of other exposures. Every time you buy a product, it's a mixture of different chemicals. So those chemicals are being, ex you're being exposed to them simultaneously. And that's true of a lot of things in life. If we were to create temporal life stage geospatial maps, we could probably identify that covariance structure and we could start to reconstruct past exposomes by knowing that covariance structure. We could start to model them. We could start to impute them at the individual level. So measuring the exposome should parallel methods used in genomics. We should estimate past exposure, which I would argue is feasible if we understand the covariance structure. And cohort period effects will mean models that we create using exposomic data that's geospatially um, distributed will actually change over time. We will have a different model for 1990 than 1995 than 2000 than 2015. As long as we make our maps to include uh, life stage, SES, occupation, but most importantly, geography, we'll be able to create, understand that covariance structure and we'll be able to impute uh, missing, the missing exposomics. So we can reconstruct past exposure through imputation at the, in, at the individual level, or we could model it at the geographical level, much as we do with air pollution today. This is one of my favorite quotes. This is a science fiction uh, author, William Gibson. He wrote a novel called Neuromancer. Uh, for those of you who are science fiction fans, the movies, The Matrix, are actually based on uh, the Neuromancer novel. And a quote from uh, that novel is, the future is already here, it's just not very evenly distributed. And I didn't actually understand this quote when I first read it. And what I'm starting to understand is that we have a lot of these tools that we can bring together to measure 
the exposome and to create exposomic maps, but they're not evenly distributed and we're not bringing them together. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We probably don't need as much new technology as we think. What we really need to do at the beginning is actually just bring all this information together and make it more evenly distributed. There are lots of existing resources. Um, we do have to integrate and expand and create a larger goal of predicting the past exposome. So I would argue that if we create an exposome map and we make it geographic, we make it life stage specific, or we make it calendar specific, we can actually impute a large portion of the exposome, just as haplotype tag SNPs help you imp impute a large amount of genetic variability. We have to do this in an organized fashion. Right now, it's very bottom-up. I think bottom-up growth is very slow and is unlikely to organically reach this goal. We have to make this the goal. And if we make this the goal, I think we can do this. And we can do this in a relatively brief amount of time. And brief, in this case, would probably be 5 to 15 years. But that's still an achievable goal. And there's a lot of existing resources. This slide just shows some of those resources, uh, uh, tissue-specific exposome sources, such as the Comparative Toxicogenomics Database, uh, the Blood Exposome Database that one of our colleagues here, Dinesh um, Kumar, uh, actually developed. And there's many other databases that actually can be brought together. There's also maps of all kinds of environmental factors. EPA has searchable databases on environmental contaminants. So EPA has air pollution maps. USGS has maps as well of chemicals and soil, uh, climate data, as well as water data. NOAA and NASA have maps on, on climate data as well. Here has a repository of biomarker data. NHANES has a uh, repository of biomarkers that are basically a time series going back to the 1970s. We need to start attaching more metadata to the biomarker data. We, need, we rarely link them to geospatial information. This is a real missed opportunity. So I think if we were to start including geospatial information every time we measure an untargeted assay, we would start to better understand the geospatial distribution of the exposome. And if we attach that to other characteristics of the person that we measure that on, their occupation, their age, their life stage, and those sorts of things, we'll have a better understanding of how the exposome varies within different individuals, different populations, across space and across time. As we, and remember, zip code is actually a better predictor of health than DNA. So there's a lot of information in geography, and we need to link that to the exposome. And there have been some initial attempts at mapping the environment. This is actually a group out of uh, Australia uh, that actually is starting to map things like house dust and soil and water quality in different homes. And they've measured this in about 2,000 homes. It's a start. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of geospatial distribution. But if we start to use this information and build upon it, I think we're going to start having real exposome maps that are usable that we can use in our research. And you know, we have to keep in mind that there are geographical, life stage, occupational, temporal information, and untargeted assays, often in the metadata. So we need to start mapping them and so we can understand how different um, um, environments actually change based on time and space. Some biomarkers already go back in time. One of our faculty here, uh, Manish Aurora, developed a biomarker using teeth. Teeth grow like trees. And those uh, rings that are found in teeth actually correspond to dates, calendar dates. So if you measure environmental factors and you understand how the rings are formed, you can actually attach a calendar date. We should be mapping this information. This is longitudinal geospatial exposomic data that we can map that will go back in time and give us information on multiple calendar years and multiple life stages. This is another way that we can get closer and closer to exposome maps. And there's a lot of information in public databases. This is a map of the New York Housing and Preservation Department lead violations. And there's a lot of geospatial information. So we know from this map that if you live in uh, Upper Manhattan in Harlem or Morningside Heights, or if you live in the Bronx, you're statistically more likely to be exposed to lead than if you live on the Upper East Side or in Midtown Manhattan. This map actually illustrates this. So there's other types of data that can actually help us as we build these exposome maps. <clears throat> 
And there's even models for lead poisoning. So there are validated um, analytical models that can predict blood lead levels geospatially across the United States. And I think now, because of genomics, we have a lot of new tools, such as artificial intelligence and deep learning, that can be used to create prediction models with untargeted or higher dimensional data. And if we start including this data over time, we can actually start to impute different environmental exposures. So this is why I think an exposomic nap is a really high priority going forward for the whole field of exposomics. So where do we start? Well, we got to start with language. So exposomics, all science is a language, and exposomics is a language. And so this is the Tower of Babel, and the Tower of Babel is an origin myth in the Bible in which God punishes humans by giving them different languages so that they can't communicate. So a lot of science is an analogy to the Tower of Babel. We don't communicate with each other. We often use the same term to mean something completely different. So a term in one particular field may mean something completely different in another field. I remember being very confused by the use of the word unbiased in genomics research, and then I finally discovered that it actually refers to sequencing in a particular area of the genome. And from an epidemiologic framework, when we say bias, we're talking about the problems of our study. In genomics, when they say bias, they don't actually say bias, they say unbiased to give the impression, well, it gives the impression if you're an epidemiologist that your study doesn't have any problems. Uh, so it, it's just a different way of speaking, but it creates communication problems when people speak different languages. So we do need to create a language of exposomics that we all agree to. So, Right now, exposomic scientists don't speak a common language. Um, the terminology is still ambiguous. The same word can be used to describe more than one thing. Uh, genomics went through the same sort of growing pains many years ago and created different ontologies. The most common one, or the biggest one, is gene ontology, which is the means by which what we know about the genome is attached to the sequence. There are some initial attempts at this. Uh, the CAS registry assigns numbers to chemicals, and it's a good starting point for chemicals in the exposome. But exposomics, as we've heard today, is not just chemicals. It's the social environment. It's the physical environment. It's the nutritional environment. So there's all kinds of different types of data, but we have to create a common ontology for them as a starting point. So once we create that ontology, we can start creating the language of exposomics, and we can start creating these maps. So I think that's actually the first step. So we have to start, uh, as Gary Miller has said, uh, with information that we already have. So we have a lot of data on lead, a lot of data on air pollution. We have a lot of data on different environmental exposures. Even some of them are non-chemical, such as stress and smoking, uh, as well as depression. And we know their geospatial distribution. There are maps for all these things. Uh, we need to incorporate the well-studied environmental factors into an exposome map to begin with, and then start layering on all the different types of data that we're also going to collect, the photographs, the wearable devices. And we need to start factoring geography and time and life stage as well. So we want to build a life stage searchable exposome database, that is, understand how the exposome varies from pregnancy or even preconception through infancy, childhood, adolescence, adulthood, young adults, teenagers, elderly. Then we need to layer on a geospatial component to that database both on the internal and external exposomes, so not just biomarkers and untargeted assays, but also things like climate and um, air pollution, uh, and make that life stage specific, and then build a temporal searchable database, i.e., the changes over calendar years. How does the exposome change from 1990 to 2000 to 2010, and so on, so that we can start to model the exposome. And once we have that information, we can actually start to model the parts of the exposome we haven't actually measured, because we can infer them, we can model them, we can impute them. So in terms of uh, community engagement and community-based participa community participatory research, well, exposomics is discovery research. We know that racism correlates with toxic environments. Certain neighborhoods are more likely to have toxic waste sites placed next to them. They're also more likely to be where the bus depots are, more likely to have placement of waste stations. They're less likely to have healthy food access, and they're going to have less green space. Those events are not random. As we create these exposome maps, we're going to discover more types of health hazards and where they're placed. And we're going to actually be able to make interventions, and we're going to have to be, and we're going to be better equipped 
to understand why health inequities occur, because they occur in large part because of our exposome. And in fact, uh, the United Church of Christ did the initial work on this. In 1987, they commissioned a study that showed that Superfund toxic waste sites are far more likely to be placed next to communities of color than any other place in the country. So largely white communities did not have very many Superfund waste sites. They were always placed in urban areas with minoritized populations or in rural areas on, on tribal land. And that was actually the United Church of Christ that did that work. And that's the way the world works. And so as we start to measure the exposome, we're going to understand the way the world works. And we're going to understand why health inequities occur. And we're going to be better equipped to try to, to minimize them. So operationalizing an exposome map. So we need to develop the methods to impute and model the exposome across time, place, life stage, and calendar year. And I think an exposomic map will enable us to do that. We're going to have to validate and calibrate the model. I think we're going to uh, determine what I'm going to call tagged exposomic markers, which are uh, analogous to haplotype tag SNPs that identify important mixtures from the past. So these may even be environmental factors that are not toxic, but they will actually identify other types of environmental toxins because they tend to correlate. And if we can understand the covariance structure of the exposome, we can start to model the exposome for both the relevant factors using the factors that we now think are irrelevant at times, ironically. We're going to be able to do critical window research better because we're going to be able to go back in time, which means we're going to be able to do gene and environment interaction research better because gene and environment interactions are actually dependent in part on critical windows. And we're going to be able to predict environment in minoritized neighborhoods better. And then we're going to be able to build, once we've built this map, we're going to be able to refine the models by adding more data over time. And we're going to better understand how the exposome exists. And it's going to be a less costly measurement because we're going to model some of it. We're not going to have to measure the exposome in everybody. In some cases, if we collect enough data, enough information on populations and people across time and space, we're going to be able to model it, which is actually going to be far more cost effective. 